All right. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to hide these uh, floating meeting controls up at the top of my screen. So if anyone has a question, um, I won't be able to see like the, uh, a hand raised in the chat or anything. So please just you know wait for me to end a sentence or something and, and interrupt. I have no problem with that. I think it makes for a better talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, direct detection of dark matter. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about what dark matter is. So let's see, why is that not shifting? Okay, scrolling works. Uh, I'm going to talk about why uh, dark matter is um, a thing, why, what evidence astronomically do we say means dark matter exists. I'm going to go over some candidates, some uh, theoretical models that tell us if it is a particle, uh, what kind of particle it is. And then I'll get to detection, where in each of these two cases, axions and WIMPs are two of the theories that I'll focus on up here. I'm going to start with the traditional detection, so people interested in dark matter who are specifically looking for dark matter. And then I'm going to talk about some uh, condensed matter uh, approaches. In the case of axions, uh, quite an unexpected one. And WIMPs is just kind of um, a new avenue of research that, that people are, are looking to um, start some collaboration between uh, the detection community and, and uh, condensed matter. So firstly, why do we know that dark matter exists? Um, one of the, the main uh, issues is that if we, you know, humans, stars, um, planets around stars, all the visible matter that we see in the universe, if that was the only matter or mass in, in the universe, there are a host of things that we either observe or even the shape of our universe itself, which we'll get to in a second, wouldn't, um, it wouldn't link up if, if that were the amount of mass in the universe. So, firstly, um, there, are, there are kind of three um, main problems that I think are the most um, telling that, that something is up and, and that our, our theory is, is missing something. Um, number one is the galaxy rotation. If you think about Kepler's law, uh, the distance as a planet gets farther and farther away from the sun, or in a galaxy, like a, if you think about a spiral arm in a galaxy, the as you get farther away, it should be rotating slower. The kind of the center of the galaxy is spinning quickly, and the outside is spinning slower. Uh, but that's not what's observed. After some critical radius, uh, the the spiral arm rotates at exactly the same rate as it does, um, you know, one parsec away from a million parsecs away. Um, and the kind of huge um, explanation for this is that there is much more mass in that galaxy that we can't see at the moment. The next piece of evidence is kind of uh, very much related to Mike's talk last week. We know from GR that light bends around an object. It's called the gravitational lensing. If we, and this was um, actually my question um, last week for Mike's talk, was that there is this kind of relationship where you can uh, use the equation, um, equations from GR and, and densities, and, and look for look to see how much bending is going on, and you can use that to measure the mass of the thing that's causing the bending, the, you know, cur curving the spacetime. Uh, but in reality, the mass that is causing um, this bending is way more than what is actually seen in visible matter. Um, so that's leading people to say that there's much more mass in a, in a particular area um, wherever this gravitational lensing occurs that leads us to believe that the visible matter is not the only thing that we're seeing or it exists. Uh, one particular example of this is the so-called bullet cluster galaxy. It provides a, one of the best um, evidence of that there's a lot more matter that we can't see because in particular the two galaxies that are colliding in this bullet cluster are, are rather small, um, but the gravitational lensing that we see is enormous. Uh, so there's, there's a ton of dark matter around um, in that particular region of the bullet cluster galaxy. That leads us to believe that there's uh, dark matter. And finally, um, I think one of, um, to me, the most convincing um, evidence of dark matter is that the actual shape of our universe and where where we're located, where everything else is, is located based on the cosmic microwave background imaging, it would not 
exist as it as we observe it um, if our if ordinary matter were the only matter in the universe in particular um, if it were the only matter in the universe uh, the structure formation would have occurred at a much earlier time uh, the radiation uh, dominated beginning of the universe right after the big bang it would not have allowed the structure formation to occur at the time which would have allowed the structure we see in the cosmic microwave background. If we include dark matter, uh, this would kind of disallow the radiation because dark matter is only affected by gravity, and it would the universe would continue to expand, and then the structure formation period would happen at a later time. If you notice, uh, in, in all three of these reasons, um, one thing that we kind of took for granted was that Einstein's general relativity was the correct formation of gravity. Uh, I won't talk about it a ton, but I think it's, it's kind of an interesting take on the matter, um, is, is to say, what if there is no problem? Um, you know, there's either uh, the standard model or, or gravity, and, and one of them, uh, you know, they don't incorporate each other. So, so something is up, and, and one path of research in the starting from the 80s up until, up until um, Eric Berlinda's uh, entropic gravity in 2011 and 16. Um, these, are, these are two theories that have been, in, in the case of modified Newtonian dynamics, or MOND, was formed directly to kind of answer the, at the time, most prevalent example of dark matter. Um, and yes, it, it does that. It's a, you know, a new theory of gravity that accounts for this. Um, however, it, it um, as new evidence came out for, for dark matter, it, it has failed um, many times to, to um, kind of uh, rationalize uh, or explain away that maybe dark matter doesn't exist. It's just a, a gravity thing. Um, and similarly with entropic gravity, which is um, it's a statement or a theory that gravity is, is not a fundamental force, but rather it's emergent from thermodynamics, um, I think. Well, the easiest way to, to think about this is kind of like the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy of a black hole. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more about that later in the semester with like the ADS-CFT talk. Um, but it's it's not necessarily string theoretic, even though um, the creator of it is a string theorist. It's more um, a generic um, thermodynamic holographic principle. Um, however, um, both of these new theories um, don't account for all the reasons we see today. Um, they're just, you know, things that, um, you know, popular things that came out and people um, thought about it for a little bit. But, um, you know, especially with LIGO in, in uh, five years ago, six years ago, no, no five years ago, um, you know, it, Einstein is looking pretty good. Um, so it's it's uh, just just a, an aside to, to talk about. So if, if we assume that GR is correct, um, what else, what else could dark matter be now? Um, it needs to actually be something now. We can, we can look at the standard model and say, what if there's a new particle? Um, we know that um, for what it does, the standard model is you know, one of the most successful theories ever. Uh, but we know it's not complete because gravity isn't a part of it. Um, so it, asks, it begs the question, like, what if there is a new particle, dark matter, uh, and how does it fit into the standard model? Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the measured total dark matter content of the universe, that comes yes. directly from the microwave background? No. Um, from a variety of sources. Um, from, you know, gravitational lensing um, as like a, a benchmark. So um, we know that around um, particular things, um, there is, you know, X amount more dark matter. Um, but yes, in, in as a whole, in general, it is the cosmic yeah. microwave background. Um, if you, um, if people remember back to your talk where you had the, um, uh, oh gosh, I don't remember the name of the pictures, but it was, it was a specific type of picture from the cosmic microwave background where it were like these, uh, blue lines of, of ordinary matter and, and dark, uh, yeah. dark blue or dark black, uh, circles of, of dark matter. And that's a kind of a way to get an estimate on, you know, where these, uh, numbers actually come from. So if we assume uh, that dark matter is a particle, um, one of the first things you know we need to study about it is its mass, um, and in particular, the mass range of all the um, 
theorized candidates for dark matter is uh, an enormous range, all the way down from the primordial black holes, which after um, LIGO was a, a, a popular thing people have been thinking about, maybe the black holes that formed at the beginning of the, of the universe, they are actually black holes. Um, there's a lot of, um, it, obviously, more theoretical work on it at the moment, but as, as LIGO came, um, there's a, a ton of uh, opportunity to, to further study that. And then at the far end, so this is a huge mass scale, 21 to 10 to the 66 EV. At the bottom, we have this fuzzy dark matter, which is kind of a, an explanation that um, whenever you do cosmological simulations, you encounter something that is not in reality. Uh, there is this kind of, it's called the cuspy halo problem. Um, and it's very um, linked to a disconnect between every, every simulation that's ever been done as well as uh, what we see in reality. But what I'm going to talk about in this talk are the two that I, I am most, and I think most people are most interested in um, based on the amount of money that's spent looking for them, are what's called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, and the QCD axion. First, let's talk about the axion. The theoretical problem that this was um, hypothesized to solve is what's called the strong CP problem. That states that um, at all other scales in, in the standard model, uh, CP symmetry is violated. CP symmetry, the charge parity symmetry, is that if you exchange a particle with its antiparticle, uh, the laws of physics should be the same. Um, and the strong CP problem is that there is no CP violation in quantum chromodynamics, um, which is odd because the, the that part, or, you know, the, the QCD part of the standard model Lagrangian explicitly has like the, the, the theta term is could very well, um, you know, pen and paper break uh, CP violation. However, it's never been observed um, in in any um, experiment, and so this uh, Pesci Quinn theory is kind of a way to uh, solve this um, conundrum that, that takes place, like why isn't CP symmetry broken? And they do that by introducing a new field, uh, a U1 field, where when it, the symmetry is spontaneously broken, the Goldstone boson, or the particle associated with that spontaneously broken symmetry, is coined the axion, after um, laundry detergent for some reason, by uh, Frank Wilczek, the Nobel Prize winner. Now, before I gave this talk, um, just you know, in, in high school and college, I always thought that WIMPs were kind of the most conservative um, approach to dark matter. Um, just naively, um, you know, I, I assumed that the, the one that had the most amount of money spent on it would be the most conservative. Um, but it, it's actually quite um, theoretically motivated and, and uh, even aesthetically motivated. Um, the kind of um, reason that the, the WIMP came into being was, was related to this hierarchy problem that we see, that certain strengths of the standard model and around us are weaker or stronger. For instance, the weak force is much, much greater than gravity. Like, why is that? Um, as well as this kind of aesthetic appeal in, in theoretical physics of naturalness, that a theory shouldn't need to be, the parameters of a theory shouldn't need to be fine-tuned uh, too much to, to describe reality. And a popular solution to this came with the kind of algebraic gauge theory um, structure uh, supersymmetry, which um, in particle terms is, is kind of a theoretical relationship between uh, a boson and a fermion. And in particular, if you include supersymmetry in the standard model, uh, the result is that each new each particle in, in the standard model would have a new particle uh, called a superpartner. And WIMPs are a super partner. They're a super partner of the electroweak bosons. Um, so that was that was probably the most um, shocking thing uh, to me that um, WIMPs are kind of uh, intrinsically related to supersymmetry and, and this like natural naturalness uh, hierarchy problem uh, in, in theoretical physics. So firstly, let's talk about axions. And in each of these sections, what I'll do is I will start with kind of the traditional way that people um, studying dark matter uh, thought up to look for dark matter. 
Um, and then, uh, especially in the Axion section, I'll take a, a, a rather long, maybe five minute aside, uh, to talk about some, some band theory um, from condensed matter, and then kind of hit you at the end with a huge, um, unexpected um, development in, in condensed matter that uh, at least the researchers are claiming, and, and by the amount of citations and popular science articles written about it, it, it seems convincing. So first I'll start off with the traditional detection. This occurs at the University of Washington, at the Axion Dark Matter Experiment, and uh, at Yale before University. You, uh, before you go there, yeah, uh, so I just have a question about WIMPs. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that WIMPs are some, are there any models that uh, solve the hierarchy problem using WIMPs somehow? Or is it just like a conceptual relation between, like, WIMPs also come from supersymmetry and supersymmetry also? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I was just trying to draw a relationship between, like, these two um, problems that, that people have with, you know, this uh, relationship between, you know, beauty, beauty and, and, um, and physics. And, um, you know, supersymmetry has is, is long been uh, thought to be like a kind of um, a way that all of that works out. Um, and supersymmetry is, is what WIMPs are based on. So I just wanted to kind of connect that, that line of thinking. Okay. Thank you. So traditionally, at the um, University of Washington and Yale, um, based on this Pesci-Quinn theory that we mentioned in the, in the kind of creation of axions, they are theorized to interact when there's a magnetic field um, in, in play with a virtual photon. And the idea of the experiment is to detect the physical photon that's emitted in this reaction. Um, the particular challenge is that the QCD axion could potentially be, uh, you know, 10 to the negative 12 EV uh, up to MEV. So in, in these, they're kind of right in the middle, uh, but there's there's a huge effort to try to push this, this mass gap down, which is incredibly hard because they are, you know, kind of oops, running into, you know, a, a ton of quantum noise, and that's why, you know, they're going to such low temperatures when they do this, um, as well as just... Um, making ton of like collaboration with, with quantum information and, and com computational um, uh, quantum physicists. So in order to get the uh, detector down to uh, a temperature where it can detect um, such low frequencies corresponding to the axion mass is a, is a big challenge for this. Uh, but at the moment, um, as we'll see with the other traditional detection for WIMPs, uh, there has not been um, you know, detection of dark matter most of the traditional methods thus far have kind of mapped exclusion curves, if you will. Like they, they have mapped out an area that says, if the mass were this mass, we would have seen it. Um, and so they, their work is just, at this point, the traditional um, route to go is to make an incredibly sensitive detector and say with confidence that it, it's not this. Uh, and you know, because, the, I mean, in, in reality, that's quite a, um, a good way to go because there is a huge uh, parameter space for the mass. So excluding things is quite reasonably uh, very efficient to detect something in the future. Now, a quick aside into condensed matter theory, just so that I can um, explain you know, what, what happened um, in, this, in this last slide here and how it relates to axions in, in any way, shape, or form. So we know that uh, with atoms, the energy levels are quantized. If we put you know, a singular atom into a crystal or, or a material, the energy levels become energy bands, where this band uh, picture here, the relationship between you know, this momentum space picture is kind of, uh, this is a, a most, most generic um, energy band picture, where what you'll likely recognize from, you know, you know, a modern physics course or something like that. Uh, there's this valence band at the bottom where, you know, the atom is, where the electron is, is in the atom, and the conduction band where the electron has been, you know, shot out. A particular um, kind of revolutionary topic in condensed matter nowadays is what's called Dirac matter. Um, the most fascinating to me is that, um, you know, you would expect uh, to use the Dirac equation when you're working with particle physics and high energy physics and things like that. But it turns out when the bands on uh, an energy band become linear, so much so that they meet at a single point called the Dirac point, 
the electrons behave as if they're massless and move relativistically. Um, and so this, the use of the you know, particle physics-like um, relativistic Dirac equation actually comes into play. One last piece of nomenclature that I, I want to review before um, giving the big announcement is what's called a charge density wave as a result of um, a, a Peralis transition. So the, the idea is that if we think about a uniformly spaced atom or a uniformly spaced um, one-dimensional lattice of atoms, if we were to you know, have it at room temperature or something like that uh, and cool it down uh, below some critical temperature, the you know, quantum effects like the electron-phonon interaction would occur and the, the un uniform distribution of the atoms would no longer hold. And the result of this is that there are now kind of preferred, energetically preferred places for the atom to sit, notably in these band gaps that form at the half build level of the Fermi energy. And so now there's you know, a non-homogeneous um, distribution of the atoms, and this uniform charge density on the material is now you know, sinusoidal or, or wave-like. And the condensate that forms on here, like um, phonons or the um, both Einstein condensate, this is called a charge density wave. So now for the big reveal, studying these wild semi-metals, a particular example of uh, the Dirac metals, it was cooled down to a very low temperature, as well as electromagnetic fields were introduced, and the result of this electromagnetic field is that, yes, the bands are still linear, but it's made kind of an insulator material in the sense that the um, the bands now, there, there is a, a minimum energy gap that, that needs to be jumped. And what researchers showed uh, two years ago was that the charge density wave that forms on this uh, semi-metal was in, in all ways, shapes, and forms, in, in the presence of an electromagnetic field, uh, exhibited exactly the behavior that an axion would, according to the Pesci Quinn theory and, and all theoretical workups of, of what an axion should do in interacting with these fields. Um, so this was kind of um, probably a very unexpected thing that, that occurred and, and one of the most exciting things that I learned while making this talk. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So like uh, the production of axion, as you said, is because of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yeah. So is such kind of a mechanism happening here also or is it? Totally oh yeah, I would, I would assume that the electromagnetic field is breaking the U1 symmetry. Um, or is it like a different process uh, altogether in this condensed matter system? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, it might be related to the fact that uh, this insulator may may be topological um, in, in the sense that like um, there may be some topologically pr protected phase that um, stretches across this Fermi surface. Um, at, at first, I, I, I do think that um, the electromagnetic field would would break the U1 symmetry. Um, mm -hmm. You're right. There's a ton of physics in these like wild semi-metals that um, I may not be um, knowledgeable about to, to know what in fact is breaking the U1 symmetry. Okay. Thanks. That's a great question. Thank you. Well, likewise, um, what I'll do in this. Uh, section is talk first about um, the traditional ways that people go about um, searching for WIMPs and then um, because of um, similarly uh, null results like it, it doesn't exist here um, why people are, are kind of um, looking further down the mass spectrum and kind of abandoning the um, supersymmetric or, or natural type, type of WIMPs and going for what I'll call non-natural WIMPs and hence why I put the little quotes here. So traditionally, what, what occurs is that at, at places like Lux in uh, South Dakota in the U.S., Xenon in Italy, and Zeppelin in the U.K., this is just uh, the, the three most popular, uh, but there are many, many of these. Um, the mechanism that this um, kind of relies on is that you take a sample, for instance, Xenon or Argon, hence the name, um, you put it in a, a very shielded sample, I'll get to it on the next page, and you wait for a dark matter to collide with the nucleus, and you measure that in some form of temperature, heat, uh, 
charge, or, or even um, uh, light. And so the experimental setup here is to put something very, very far underground. Um, for example, I'm, I'm taking the American experiment here, the, well, housed in America, but, but um, you know, many collaborators uh, in South Dakota. It's um, a kilometer and a half underground to shield from cosmic rays, as well as surrounded by a shell of titanium and quite a bit of water um, to, to reduce uh, radioactivity um, around the, the sample. And so you kind of have this sample of xenon in here and wait for dark matter to collide with nuclei and you work on kind of um, making sure that the signals you get are not due to cosmic rays or radioactivity, which could mimic um, the, the things that you're trying to look for. And you, um, you know, look for the signals where you say, okay, this could potentially have been dark matter. Um, again, as, as was the case with axions, the result of these experiments um, has been, um, at, as they increase in precision, just better and better exclusion curves, which tell you that the dark matter is not there. Uh, again, like the, the rationale is, we know it's not there because we're confident in the sensitivity of our device, and we would have detected it at, at that mass range. And so what's happening at, at this point in, in this kind of crisis that's occurring with you know a ton of null results is people are going back to this mass scale, and they're saying, okay, let's kind of abandon WIMPs for a minute and look at all the other ways, hidden sector kind of meaning that it is interacting with the standard model in a way that we don't understand at the moment. Let's just look down on mass scales. Now, the problem with this is that if you think about this setup that we had at, at first, if you lower the theory, you look for a smaller mass on the dark matter, it would be like a, um, a ping pong ball hitting a, a boulder. It, it's not going to move your nucleus, so you need to think of a new way to detect things. Um, so one of the most popular is to simply scatter it off something else, notably the electron. Um, so for instance, you can um, have kind of a, a sample and wait for it to scatter with electrons, and this kind of opens a whole new door for um, probing different mass ranges for the following reason. Um, you can work out the kinematics uh, based on your, you know, if you're looking at, let's say, uh, one MeV, I would like to look for one MeV dark matter. And then you work out based on, like, astronomical data, because you can look at rotation curves and where we are, you can get uh, kind of a density of dark matter in your particular region and look at the speed of the dark matter in our particular region of the galaxy. And from that, you can know how much energy would be imparted on an electron if that collision were to occur. And now, you have an exact number on the energy that would be imparted on this valence band, uh, and you know how much it would go to the conduction band. So now there's this huge um, opportunity for, for collaboration with um, condensed matter and, and detection because you can think of all different types of material. Notably, you can stick with your xenon, where the band gap for xenon or, or argon or something like that would be on the order of 10 MeV, and then using those kinematics and the, the, um, the speed of dark matter in, in our region of the universe, you can work out that you would be able to probe down to 5 MeV dark matter. Now, that's a relatively high band gap. Um, you can go lower with semiconductors, and these materials called scintillators, which are very similar to superconductors, just when uh, um, an electron jumps from the balance to conduction band, it actually emits a photon. Um, and so that's one way that you can detect these things. You can um, have a scintillating material and a bunch of you know, photo detectors on the, on the outside of your material, go to very low temperatures to eliminate noise and, and look for light signals. Um, one other way, uh, involving semiconductors and also scintillators is um, what you know, prompted this talk and, and having this talk as a, as a topic, which is that uh, Professor Ruben Essek and Marie V. Um, Fernandez Serra uh, both have been collaborating, you know, a particle physicist and a condensed matter physicist, as well as their graduate students on how can we detect in, in scintillators and semiconductors the rates at which the electrons jump and how can we um, you know, counts when when a single when a single thing happens in, in a huge material. It's you know 
you don't have just one atom of a semiconductor. You know, it's a, it's a material. So it's it's a ton of uh, theoretical and computational work that goes into making uh, detectors like that. Also, um, you know, much more um, further down the road, this is still um, completely theoretical. But in theory, um, with these direct materials that we had before, as well as superconductors, the dark matter can come and hit a Cooper pair to excite it, or it could hit the um, the valence band on a direct material and jump it up. Where here, the notable difference is that the uh, the band gap in these materials is exceedingly low, and so you can probe potentially all the way down to the KEV scale, going all the way down kind of like the limit of the hidden sector. Um, so this is a very exciting uh, time for dark matter. There's kind of um, these huge um, collaborations with um, you know between condensed matter and, and dark matter you know searchers uh, in, in this in this respect. And here, I, I hope to, to hear more about kind of um, dark matter physicists uh, looking into this and, and you know, thinking, uh, what does this mean and, and how can they, they study it? So in conclusion, uh, what we did today was, was look at you know, the evidence for dark matter, why, why we think dark matter is, is all around us. And inherent in that is kind of taking GR to be, to be gospel um, and then thinking rather about what kind of particle could dark matter be and, and how might it fit into the standard model? How does it interact and things like that? And then we looked at how historically two candidates, notably axions and WIMPs, both natural and non-natural, have been um, searched for, um, as well as what avenues of either unexpected or, or um, intentional has condensed matter collaboration between particle physics and condensed matter open for uh, dark matter. So I... Um, had you know for, for every all of these slides um, if you're interested in reading any of the articles all this, all the citations at the end of a paragraph are like the scientific articles that led me to draw these conclusions and the citations at the end are, are for the picture so um, please um, you know feel free to use any of those links and thank you for the opportunity to talk Thank you. Any any questions? Um, I have one question. Um, so regarding the retention of axions, um, so the axion will be converted to two, some two photons or something, right? And we detect the photons which are generated. Mm -hmm. So uh, the magnetic field in which uh, the detector is kept, relatively, uh, what is the value? Like, do you know how high the value is, or uh, what is the state of the uh, cavity there for the detector? That's a good question. Um, I know um, not outrageous. Um, a, a few Tesla. I, I know that one of them um, going on at the university, the, the one that went on at the University of Washington, for instance. Uh, yeah, this one at University of Washington. I believe, um, I, I would need to read these articles again. I believe it was 10 Tesla, um, and, and I don't. Um, yeah, I, I, I know that the main the main feature is that in the presence of a, of a magnetic field, um, this uh, process occurs. Um, and like, how likely is it that the axions are converted to photons, or like, like is it a common phenomenon, or uh, a, um, that that I don't know. Um, uh, and that's a that's a great question because you would need to. Um, if it's a common, um, if it's a common uh, frequency event, then you would need to. Hmm. That's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. How how frequently it's it's reported that um, dark matter would happen? I, I imagine you can combine um, kind of uh, the astronomical data, um, knowing the the speed. And while we don't know the density of dark matter, I, I mean, I'm sorry, we don't know the mass of dark matter, we do know the, the density from the kind of uh, dark matter halo that, that surround us um, based on our, you know, speed and, and rotation rate and things like that. Um, so I, I would imagine that the way to answer that question would be to look at, you know, a particular volume, we'd know how much dark matter is supposed to be in that volume, um, and then you know use the volume of, of your your um, radio frequency cavity here 
uh, to estimate how many times uh, a collision would occur. Sure. I think that makes sense. Sure, thanks. Okay. More questions? Uh, hi, could you please go back to your slide number, number seven? Number seven. Eight. Seven. Oh, yes. Yeah, actually, I know I know little about your uh, the topic you have, you have talked in this slide. So could you please make more explanations on uh, why uh, the dark matter is related to the uh, effect on this so it's basically the sense that if dark matter wasn't there and it was just ordinary matter, um, ordinary matter does interact with radiation. Um, so the radiation dominated time after the Big Bang um, would have kind of washed out any of the structure formation that was occurring um, and, and it would have um, led to structure formation forming or beginning at a time that was not um, or is not uh, compatible with what we see in the cosmic microwave background. But rather, if there was uh, the preponderance of, of dark matter from the beginning of the universe, which is only affected by gravity, um, that we know at the moment, the radiation would not have affected the dark matter. The universe would have continued to expand, and the structure formation would have occurred at a time that is more appropriate for what we observe um, based on the, the structure, the large-scale structure of our universe. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, why is CP symmetry baking so important? CP symmetry. It's just um, it's just odd um, because at, at all other parts in in um, particle physics, CP symmetry is violated. Um, but it, for some reason, in in quantum thermodynamics, there has never been observed um, CP symmetry breaking. Um, and the the main problem with this is that. If you look um, at the, I guess like the, the theta term probably in the in the QCD Lagrangian for the standard model, um, very varying that there's quite um, simply like a, a, a reason that CP via CP symmetry would be violated. Um, you know, it's not um, theoretically it, it should be violated based on what we you know have in, in our in our toolkit. Um, for the, the standard model Lagrangian, and the fact that it, it isn't, um, it never is violated in nature, um, led these researchers to kind of um, try to amend that part of the Lagrangian to introduce something that uh, would explain that. Okay, do we have more questions? If not, I think we should uh, thank Jason again. And our next speaker is uh, already here. Yeah, Q. Q. I'm not sure if I 